welcome. Uh, my name is Etioni Alarondo, the executive director of the Melissa Institute. Uh, and uh, this is a very important and auspicious time to be doing uh, violence prevention work in this nation. Um, it's important because uh, along with the COVID-19, we have seen a surge in intimate partner violence, gun violence, increased awareness about police violence. And as the tragic events uh, in Atlanta recently reminded us, uh, racial and gender-based violence are also creeping in and increasing in these nations in ways that are really um, worrisome. Uh, but it's also an auspicious time because COVID-19 has also helped us understand and increase awareness about the importance of prevention. And more important than that, it has really helped us see that what we do individually matters, that the small acts that we take in the right direction have an impact for the benefit of all of us. And that's in part what at the Institute we have been working for years and now are really working even with more, a greater resolve to step up and uh, in coordination with the government and public and private organizations. We are now uh, working in the development of what we hope will be um, the, the first uh, violence prevention plan for Miami-Dade County. Uh, Our speaker today, uh, uh, Reverend Charles Dinkins, has been uh, for over a quarter of a century being a fierce kind of advocate of prevention and preventive practices in the area, not only of, of violence, but in health in general, particularly as it affects the African-American community, the black communities in, in Miami and the brown communities in our regions. And, and uh, uh, so I, I am so thrilled to have you with us, Reverend Dinkins. And um, today he, he will be uh, speaking about issues that are about reconciliation, healing and growth during these particular difficult times in our lives. Uh, coming to us from a perspective of someone who's been on the field for over 25 years, taking the type of information that the Melissa Institute tries to provide to you all, the research-based information, he's been taking that information and making it useful for the folks that he's been working with. So I can, you know, let me just get out of the way and allow Mr. Dinkins now, Reverend Dinkins, uh, it's yours. So, so good morning, everyone. And let me start out by saying, um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited, uh, Dr. Tony, that you would allow us to share um, what, what we've kind of gleaned over the past 10, 12 years, attending national conferences, working toward, what started out working toward reducing substance abuse. And once we uh, received the Drug Free Community Coalition Award, I said to them at the federal level that substance abuse is only the surface level. It's the root, it's the, it's, it, is the, it is the results of the root cause of something that is taking place in our community. It is not the issue itself. It is the result of an issue. And they allowed me over the past 10 years to explore what I felt would be beneficial for the community that I serve in, which is primarily 36th Street Northwest to 79th Street, 7th Avenue to 37th Avenue Northwest. Many of us know that as Liberty City, Brownsville, Adapata. But the concepts that we talk about or will share with you are applicable across the county, uh, applicable in every community and flexible enough to where it can be designed and unique for each individual community. So as the Urban Partnership of Miami-Dade County Coalition, and Amanda, you could go ahead and put up the slides. Um, the Urban Partnership of Miami-Dade County Coalition, our goal is to seek to establish collaborations among community residents, community-based public and private not-for-profit agencies, as well as federal, state, and local governments in support of efforts geared toward building stronger families and drug-free communities leading to better youth outcomes in the 21st century. And today, what we kind of want to talk about is, is not so much um, what my path has been to get to this place of, of just learning 
that with each step comes new challenges. With each growth step comes another set of challenges. And so we've been doing this for quite a few years and we've been uh, blessed to uh, have great partners uh, and great community partners and great government partners, but yet uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of connecting the dots. Um, most persons, when we make presentations about um, trauma or prevention, my experience has been that we usually look at it from one component of youth development. What we want to talk about today is the possibility of it being um, multi um, in terms of the appropriate ages of development, having multi uh, programs at the direct service level, also including environmental strategies, things that embrace the masses of children within these communities and their families, and then also legislatively. It is, it is I've been taught and it has been my experience that uh, when you have all three, when you're, uh, when you're working to build resilience from all three levels, it, it increased the probability of sustainability of your work, your community project. So uh, this, this particular conversation is centered more around um, trauma and the fact that it does exist in all of our lives. Uh, as a community coalition, we, 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 are, we have five indicators that we've been concerned about the past five years, which is uh, substance abuse, uh, academic proficiency, youth gun murder, violence, um, uh, and um, mental health. And the, the, the four that I named are risk factors, but this fifth one is a protective factor and research has shown it is the solution and that is collective efficacy, collective community efficacy. So our lesson objective today uh, is centered to define trauma. What is trauma? Define prevention science and to define uh, what is a community coalition. So what I need to do to kind of help us out is that I like each of you as we get started here to take the time to respond to uh, the ACES question is 10 questions and uh, we want to uh, determine what is our cumulative uh, ACES score as a as a group this morning so Amanda if you can lead us in that way uh, I, I would appreciate it. Okay, so we all 10 questions have been answered. Uh, what I can tell you without pulling up the results is that at least every question was answered yes at least once. So uh, give me just one moment and I'm going to come up with our average score. Awesome. If you want to clip to the next slide. But listen, so, so when you think about adverse childhood experiences and, and the traumatic impact that they have, one has to ask themselves, honestly, is this something that we can prevent? Can we honestly prevent, you know, life incidents from occurring, right? And some of life incidents are just traumatic. They are traumatic. And so how do we really define trauma? Uh, what is trauma? Uh, as we look at this particular chart, um, can we really control um, homelessness, incarceration? mental uh, illness, divorce, physical and emotional elect. Will these things ever go away? Will we ever be able to prevent them from happening in society and in the course of our lifetimes? And, and the reasonable answer would probably be, be no. So then what, what value uh, did Dr. Anda and Peretti research bring to us who are preventionists is that he, it made it very clear and is evidenced by our responses to the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey today that, that this is something that all of us encounter, regardless of our social economic status, regardless of our ethnicity, we all have adverse childhood experiences. The difference is how we respond to them. And so when we talk about prevention, it may also be um, very wise of us to talk about how do we develop resilience? Because we cannot prevent traumatic events from occurring in life. How do you eliminate poverty? How do you eliminate discrimination? 
how do you eliminate community uh, disruption and lack of opportunity and economic mobility and social capital, even though we're talking about equity in America these days, but how do you really eliminate it? And, and at our best, will we have uh, uh, eliminated poor housing and violence, right? So how do you really eliminate these things uh, to prevent them uh, it is probably not the best way to look at this. Uh, the best way to look at this is how can we, we reduce this in the lives of children? And secondly, how can children and adults, how can we also uh, begin to develop resiliency uh, over the lifespan uh, because we will encounter these things. Uh, the next slide kind of defines for us uh, what trauma is. Uh, trauma is an actual or perceived danger that undermines our sense of physical and emotional safety. It poses a threat uh, to our safety, uh, our loved ones. It becomes so overwhelming that our coping capacities, abilities uh, are impacted and we're unable to function in what we call a normal function, right? So childhood trauma has been named our nation's single most important public health challenge. We believe that's the sweet spot, Dr. Tony, in terms of being able to address violence, is being able to create environments where young people are nurtured, whether it's happening at home or not, in the social circles in which they are growing and develop as our communities become more aware of trauma and the impact of it, and how to exercise trauma-informed care and implement trauma-informed practices, then we, we become the protective factor in the lives of our community youth. So what i like to do now, uh, play the videos, which, which speaks to the impact of trauma on our DNA, as well as the study uh, that Dr. Unden uh, uh conducted in 2013, 2014, I think it was, with the office of CDC. The reality is that we all need a certain amount of stress, a certain amount of anxiety to perform well. If we don't care about that exam that we're gonna have tomorrow, we'll probably fail. If we're gonna cross the street and a truck is coming at us, we have release of adrenaline. We have release of a hormone that we call cortisol. We wanna jump out of there and adrenaline and cortisol are gonna help us do that. So there's that good amount of stress. But if all day long you're feeling like a truck is coming at you, day after day after day, that's gonna take a toll on the body. And uh, the amygdala obviously here is has greater activation yes. in the PTSD. We were able to image children that had experienced trauma and compare those brain images with children that didn't have an experience of trauma, didn't have symptoms. Right, an exaggerated fear response. An exaggerated fear response. With decreased activation in areas that we need to control that emotion in the frontal areas. Exposure to early adversity and trauma literally affects the structure and function of children's developing brains. So the kid next to them hits them or the teacher reprimands them in a way that uh, they're uncomfortable with, right? Literally what they're feeling, that activation is like there was a truck coming at them. You can give something that will mask symptoms. Right? For example, if someone has a cough, right, you can give them a really strong cough serum that will suppress their cough. But if it's because they have tuberculosis or lung cancer, then what you're doing is merely masking the symptoms while the disease process continues to fester. We know what's happening in children's brains and bodies with the experience of toxic stress. So the question now is, what do we do about it? Well, the video is gonna talk about the adverse childhood research, adverse childhood experiences uh, research that Dr. Under and Dr. Ferretti uh, conducted, as I said, with the uh, 
with um, CDC uh, uh, back in 2013, 2014, I believe it is. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. Okay, what kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect or growing up with a parent who struggles with mental illness or substance dependence. Now, for a long time, I viewed these things in the way I was trained to view them either as a social problem, refer to social services, or as a mental health problem, refer to mental health services. And then something happened to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go someplace where I felt really needed, someplace where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center, one of the best private hospitals in Northern California. And together, we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, there had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities, access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that it felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health. And one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor and you see 100 kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea, you can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, what the hell is in this well? So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, Dr. Burke, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day, changed my clinical practice and, ultimately, my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC, and together they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called Adverse Childhood Experiences, 
or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people looked at this data and they said, come on. You know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear. <laughs> But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So for me, this information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, 
then as doctors, it is our job to use this science for prevention and treatment. That's what we do. So in San Francisco, we created the Center for Youth Wellness to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. We started simply with routine screening of every one of our kids at their regular physical, because I know that if my patient has an ACE score of four, she's two and a half times as likely to develop hepatitis or COPD. She's four and a half times as likely to become depressed, and she's 12 times as likely to attempt to take her own life as my patient with zero ACEs. I know that when she's in my exam room. For our patients who do screen positive, we have a multidisciplinary treatment team that works to reduce the dose of adversity and treat symptoms using best practices, including home visits, care coordination, mental health care, nutrition, holistic interventions, and yes, medication when necessary. But we also educate parents about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress the same way you would for covering electrical outlets or lead poisoning. And we tailor the care of our asthmatics and our diabetics in a way that recognizes that they may need more aggressive treatment given the changes to their hormonal and immune systems. So the other thing that happens when you understand this science is that you'll want to shout it from the rooftops because this isn't just an issue for kids in Bayview. I figured the minute that everybody else heard about this, it would be routine screening, multidisciplinary treatment teams, and it would be a race to the most effective clinical treatment protocols. Yeah, that did not happen. <laughs> and that was a huge learning for me. What I had thought of as simply best clinical practice, I now understand to be a movement. In the words of Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. And for a lot of people, that's a terrifying prospect. The scope and scale of the problem seems so large that it feels overwhelming to think about how we might approach it. But for me, that's actually where the hope lies. Because when we have the right framework, when we recognize this to be a public health crisis, then we can begin to use the right toolkit to come up with solutions. From tobacco to lead poisoning to HIV AIDS, the United States actually has quite a strong track record with addressing public health problems. But replicating those successes with ACEs and toxic stress is going to take determination and commitment. And when I look at what our nation's response has been so far, I wonder, why haven't we taken this more seriously? You know, at first, I thought that we marginalize the issue because it doesn't apply to us, right? That's an issue for those kids in those neighborhoods, which is weird because the data doesn't bear that out. The original ACEs study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But then, the more I talk to folks, I'm beginning to think that maybe I had it completely backwards. If I were to ask how many people in this room grew up with a family member who suffered from mental illness. I bet a few hands would go up. And then if I were to ask how many folks had a parent who maybe drank too much, or who really believed that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child, I bet a few more hands would go up. Even in this room, this is an issue that touches many of us. And I'm beginning to believe that we marginalize the issue because it does apply to us. Maybe it's easier to see in other zip codes because we don't want to look at it. We'd rather be sick. Fortunately, scientific advances and, frankly, economic realities make that option less viable every day. 
the science is clear. Early adversity dramatically affects health across a lifetime. Today, we are beginning to understand how to interrupt the progression from early adversity to disease and early death. And 30 years from now, the child who has a high ACE score and whose behavioral symptoms go unrecognized, whose asthma management is not connected, and who goes on to develop high blood pressure and early heart disease or cancer, will be just as anomalous as a six-month mortality from HIV-AIDS. People will look at that situation and say, what the heck happened there? This is treatable. This is beatable. The single most important thing that we need today is the courage to look this problem in the face and say, this is real, and this is all of us. I believe that we are the movement. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's, let's see if we can have a, a few people respond. Uh, normally, um, if this is your first time kind of hearing that information, you um, felt like I felt when I first uh, was able to hold Dr. Tony down for an hour and show him the whole video. Um, that you just want to shout it from the rooftop, right? So let, let, let's give a few people an opportunity to, um, to uh, have a say. How do, the, how do national ACEs, which study uh, present traumas, address the historic or systemic traumas of the African-American populations we serve? So the one thing, there's a few things that I understood about the ACEs um, study and the research was that it's not unique to ethnicity. It is, it is all of us have trauma. And um, the way that trauma is addressed uh, can mediate the correlation between uh, health disparities and the exposure to uh, certain levels of trauma. As we move into the presentation, I'll, I'll tell you how we how our coalition frames and used the ACES study to help us frame our community approach to addressing um, and reducing violence and increasing the probability of healing and reconciliation in our communities. When school counselors have a 900 to one caseload, it's difficult to address. Yeah, I am. Um, the school system have their own system and the way they work. And we hope in our comprehensive community planning that uh, in time, the school system would see the benefit from uh, not only understanding uh, the adverse childhood research, but understanding the impact of trauma. And also uh, with that knowledge come trauma-informed practices that can help reduce um, some of the school to prison pipeline kinds of uh, activities that occur within our school system today. So um, as we move forward, I'll talk more about it, but we believe, I believe, and my experience has been listening to other uh, community coalitions and people talk about it a whole lot smarter than me across the nation, is that the real solution is twofold. First is in children having the uh, positive adult role models in their life where they have relationships with those people to where they learn new skills, they implement those skills and there's reward and consequences associated with that child behavior. So that the influence of that positive adult role model uh, according to research mediates a lot of the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And then the question becomes, how do we take that to the masses? And I think the school is a great place for that to occur. Um, the learning curve in the school is something that, that what we're hopeful going forward with, um, would improve. Okay. That we need to heal first our own wounds before helping others is the comment that popped up. I think that went to everyone. Well, as a preacher, I, I'll tell you, you, you got to be able to preach through your pain, <laughs> you know, in order to prove to promote uh, prosperity and peace among people. You, you, it's just something we call that you gotta, you gotta build an aircraft while you're flying uh, in some sense of the word, um, because it's a constant process 
of healing. Healing is not something that's a one-time process. We're constantly being healed uh, from the encounters that we have in life. I mean, just someone saying the right words to you at the right moment creates some type of trauma. And so we're constantly healing each time we encounter uh, events that kind of upset our, our equilibrium. Um, so I, I don't see it as a, a, as a do this and then do that. I see it as a simultaneous uh, kind of way you handle life. You teach resilience by being able to handle the circumstances of life and your children learn resilience from you by watching how you deal with the stresses of life. In fact, um, you know, that's, that's how we learn, learn resilience, how to, how to deal with the adversity of life. And so what we've done as a community coalition and where we believe the real sweet spot lies in addressing these issues uh, as re is, is not only framing our community concerns through a trauma-informed lens, but understanding uh, that we as a community are really the solution, right? That if we have a community process that can help us understand the root causes of, the, the, let's say, for example, the uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, kind of uh, incidents that occur in a person's life, and we can reduce those risks, then we will have, in fact, reduced um, not only the health disparities, but we will also have uh, improved um, the safety of communities, right? Because it becomes, it becomes now we're able to reduce the risk. We're able to identify uh, families and children and people in our community who are greater at risk, say, for example, of committing violence. One of the contracts we have is relationship to uh, gun violence, either shooters or victims of being shot. And one of the common things, uh, common sets of data that we have on those young people is that they were abandoned by their parents early in life. The research points out in this thing that the solution is a relationship-based approach. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes what my experiences have been is that we address the problem uh, in siloic kinds of approaches. Uh, of course, we have our pro uh, protective factor kinds of things after school, out of school, summer camp. These are great pro-social activities. Um, but we need strategies that reduce risk factors across the four domains that are identified in the risk and protective factor framework. Those four domains are the family, the individual and the peer, the school, and the community. And what the ACES study expressed to us was that in spite of how many uh, adverse childhood experiences you had, regardless of your score, that there was hope that they could be treated, they can be treated, they can be, the, 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 the consequences can be mediated if treatment comes early. So as a coalition, we believe that our greatest response would be a comprehensive plan, next slide, a comprehensive plan that addresses the needs of children across the lifespan from prenatal until adulthood. And so our theory of, of, of change is, is that our modality, our, our methodology of change for planning, participating and evaluation of this uh, is, is that we would be able to, to determine what our long-term goals and be able to measure intermediately if we're hitting the mark, make adjustments along the way so that we don't get to the end and, and have not had the kind of impact that we desire. Prevention science uh, is, is, is the method that we use to gain that knowledge. It's, it's the strategic prevention framework is the work process that we use to accomplish this goal. Next slide. And in, in the process of, of, of looking at and, and, and working through this, we believe our prevention hypothesis is if the community coalition or community of service providers who work together in a formal coalition of that of fashion, integrate an array of ongoing uh, uh, activities, strategies based upon data uh, that we over time would improve the protective factors 
reduce the risk and build resiliency in children. As we said earlier, being able to eliminate uh, life challenges is probably not something we can do. But we can teach children how to navigate through those life challenges in such a way to where they do not lose sense of their ability to function, to, to rebound, to start over when, when, when challenges occur. Um, not, I would venture to say well over 80% of all of us on the call, if not all of us, can speak to the fact that we've overcome some traumatic challenge in our life at some point in time. And, and, and so teaching children to do that is the theory of change that we're looking to implement here um, through this, the work of the coalition. Uh, so the idea then is to facilitate resilience in youth and families to be a better inclination uh, for them to, for healthy life choices and overall wellness over the course of their lifespan. It becomes the way they live life. Uh, the next, next slide. So prevention science is a pathway to discovery of root causes of behavior. It is a process driven by the identified uh, population data results. Uh, it creates a framework of equity in both project design and service delivery. And, and, and what, I'm, what, what, what we're saying is, is that when you use strategic prevention framework, it is a scientific way of understanding root causes, protective factors, and the real issues of an identified community. Communities can have the same risk factors but have different drivers that are causing that risk. And using uh, the scientific model of prevention science that helps us to be able to tailor, uh, tailor community strategies to indigenous communities based upon uh, the participants or the residents of those communities uh, response to what we use as a, as a life experience survey. Um, the next, next slide. So as I said to you, risk and protective factors are the fundamental elements that guide prevention work as a science. Uh, different populations can have the same risk and protective factors for different root causes. With a better understanding of root causes that understand and facilitate better strategies, program design, and with the ability, uh, it equips us with the ability to uniquely address individual communities according to their specific needs. So we believe this can go uh, countywide uh, using systems that we already have in place. If we would agree to a, a um, process, the process of how we work together, what is our work process? And if we can agree to our work process and get to a place, my utopia is, is that the data is king and not personalities and power in the room, but the data is the supreme power then we really put ourselves in a position to be able to address the needs of each individual community in a way that's unique and beneficial for that particular community. Um, and uh, so, so, so then the idea is to be able to measure, you know, how do we know we're doing well? We wanna be able to measure in at least the four domains. Uh, my experience with, in doing this the last five years with our community coalition, the data that we retrieved in 2016 was so, cumbersome, it was so much to where we couldn't wrap our brains around it. It was just too much, it was too complex. So what we agreed to as a community coalition was that we were focused on one domain. And the one domain that we focused on was the family. Uh, and, and it didn't necessarily meant that we were gonna try and straighten out families. It may mean that we can't straighten out families, but how do we provide children with all of the things that what we call a good family would provide for them outside of the home. And I guess, I guess the best model of that would be, of my understanding would be the Harlem Children's Zone that happened in New York. Um, uh, being able to, to nurture children in such a way to where they know that they're supported, they feel secured. Um, we break the toxic stress of have silos where they have a, a place of, of, of solitude and uh, encouragement and nourishment, whether that's, uh, though we're focusing on the family as our uh, foundation to work from, 
uh, places that can be places of solitude, schools, community-based agencies, after-school programs, parks, um, your community becoming aware of its impact uh, 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 and uh, the positive adult relationships with children and the impact of that. And just the way we as a community handle children becomes a protective factor in the lives of children um, and, and reduce the risk across all four domains that we may be focused on just one domain and our strategies and planning. So, and this is just um, the domains and the indicators within those domains. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but in the community domain, the indicator would be availability of drugs, firearms, community laws, uh, favorable toward drug use, firearms and crime, media portrayal of behavior, uh, transition and mobility, no neighborhood attachment and community disorganization, extreme economic deprivation. Uh, and if you notice on the right side, it kind of gave you what the risk was, but violence is listed as a a risk or a risk 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 uh, risk factor for yeah. all of them uh except for uh transition and mobility as, as it relates to the community domain uh the next slide mm -hmm. will give us some uh understanding of the indicators under the family domain uh family history of problem behaviors and what we found in our work dr tony with group violence intervention is that not only have the children been abandoned by parents early in life, a large percentage of them, a large percentage of them have had parents and grandparents who were shot or other family members who were shot. The ACES study uh, expressed that the trauma experiences are, can be transferred from generation to generation if they're not treated. So we believe the sweet spot is being able to understand this and then create systems, community systems that help to mediate and break the cycle among uh, young people, whether or not we're able to change the dynamics of a family based upon their social context and the places that they're socialized. So, um, and then for school, the key indicator is lack of commitment to school. Most all of the children are identifiable either by low academic performance very early in, in, in school, antisocial behavior very early in school, and, um, and large uh, amounts of tardy and absenteeism. So there's a way to identify the children. If we could um, work out among the systems that serve children, the legality centered around confidentiality and liability, I think that could be a very a sweet spot for us. Um, and then finally, the individual themselves uh, is the fourth domain. Next slide. Right, so the individual themselves, um, antisocial behavior, rebellious, gang involvement, uh, friends who are involved in problem behaviors, favorable attitudes toward problem behavior, and early uh, intentions uh, of, of uh, indications of, of, of the uh, problem behavior and other constitutional uh, factors. Uh, in the lives of, of our young people. Um, so, so if you can go to the next slide, um, the whole idea then is to use prevention science and prevention science, one of the uh, key components in prevention science is this idea of risk and protective factor framework, which I've kind of ex explained in a, in a roundabout way, I think. Um, and the idea of prevention is to keep something from happening or to mediate the impact if something does happen. And, and there's, there's, there's the, the way to do that is either reducing the risk or increasing the protective factors in the lives of people. And as we've expressed to you, the four domains are community, family, school, and peers and the, in, in the individual. Next slide. So then prevention science, because of the complexity of life and human development, no one agency, how great it may be, can address the needs of a community in a way to where it creates 
a community social service ecosystem for all of the families in the community, right? That meets the needs of the, those, those, that community, um, whether it's direct service, universal, um, you know, intervention. None of us as an agency have the ability to provide the community with everything it needs to create a healthy community ecosystem that helps to nurture children and reduce the risk and increase the protective factors in their lives to where we can see reduces in violence, reduces in substance abuse, reduces in those impediments that hinder a good transit, a positive transition from childhood to adulthood. But prevention science alone won't get us there. It involves us, community partners, agreeing to a community process and at all levels, working to create strategies that improve our direct services, our environmental strategies, and advocacy. Anything, most things that are sustained in America are sustained because they become law. Hypothetically, the question I would ask, what would happen if Florida became a prevention state, right? What would happen? And, and that's a whole nother discussion, but, but it starts us down that path. It creates an atmosphere for systems to integrate their processes in ways to where we have to examine the way we operate. Does it help or hinder the things that we're trying to improve? It facilitates communities to change once we become aware that what we do, our practices, uh, does not help to reduce the thing that we're trying to reduce or to improve the thing that we're trying to improve. So this understanding produces organizations to have internal analysis in terms of how their processes and allegation, uh, allocation of resources align with the identified population risk and protective factors and where they invest their resources as it relates to positive youth development or addressing the identified issues of a particular community. So thinking about and working prevention in this way creates a more equitable system for serving youth and families based upon their identified needs and not what we assume their needs are as agencies and service providers. And as a community coalition, the Urban Partnership of Miami-Dade County Coalition, we use strategic prevention framework, the prevention science model to lead us down the path of discovery and planning. And here's what strategic prevention framework is. Here is the prevention science of this particular model. All prevention science models are pretty much the same in terms of, in terms of process. Um, they may have a different name, uh, but they're all pretty much the same in terms of process. Um, the beauty of strategic prevention framework is that it is a data-based approach it empowers community. It requires community partners to work together and with intentionality, implementing the most effective strategies. And we're working to achieve community level change as opposed to program level change or individual level change. Um, next slide. We do this by, uh, first of all, um, building a community coalition, a group of partners that work with intentionality, agree to the process, and strategic prevention help us build on the community-based risk and protective factors and, and develop the framework and the approach that we take toward uh, prevention. Uh, it is guided by uh, principles that can be utilized, the principles that are utilized to guide this work are, First thing we do in the first step is to assess. The assessment um, is the collecting of data, understanding the problem resources and our readiness or ability, ability as a community to address 
what the results are of our community surveys. Now, what, I, what I've seen, and my experience has been, is that most communities, when we start talking about data, we collect data from the agency. We, we use the data that already exists from uh, systems that serve a particular population. When we're talking about strategic prevention framework, we're talking about collecting data from everyone in the community, whether they are receiving some type of treatment or not from a system. Everyone in the community getting a real sample population uh, from the population to begin to gain some understanding about what the risk and protective factors are. Then we analyze, do we have the capacity to address the needs that the surveys have yielded? We begin to plan, develop comprehensive strategies to include policies and programs and practices, create logic models, database-driven plans to address the problem uh, identified in the assessment phase. And then we implement it. We get money and resources and we implement it. We activate the evidence-based strategies and program and evaluation is a part of every prevention science model. Uh, with strategic prevention framework, we are held accountable for evaluating every two years, but what we've learned over the years is that it's best to have also in between those two years, some indicators as to whether or not you're really having the kind of impact uh, that you think your activities would have. And so those five steps again are assessment, community capacity, community planning, the implementation of your strategic plan and evaluation. So then the theory of change is based upon the concept that addressing the identified risk and protective factors across the domain of a youth development spectrum. And so doing it will improve youth well-being and multiple areas of youth development domains. Strategy designs uh, applies appropriate strategies and program components at each phase of youth development, together creating a comprehensive continuum of care and support system for individuals. I've, my experience has been many, many of us um, have, have, have yet to understand what a continuum of care is. A, a continuum of care uh, is not a project. It is not a program. It is a system of support. And a single agency, regardless of how great, will not have all the needs of a community housed within that single agency. So a community continuum of care at a minimum must consist of community partners addressing the needs of a community collectively. For us as a community coalition, our utopia community, uh, here in perhaps one of the toughest communities in Miami-Dade County as a child to grow up in, is that we would have youth data-driven alliance strategies, resources, and that we would be able to obtain the kind of results that we desire. Our approach is a little bit different uh, in the sense that uh, as opposed to individuals being responsible for doing acts that um, help to reduce violence. We believe the community has the power and that is where their greatest power lies in working together to ensure that all children and youth have nurturing and supportive family, positive adult role models, safe community and coordinated community-based service providers. Children and youth achieve well-being outcomes with the effective use of prevention science models, trauma-informed care, racial equity, um, informed practices, evidence-based comprehensive community strategies, aligned integrated community um, place-based program, environmental strategies, interagency policies with commitment agreement on the area of focus and legislative advocacy, advocacy that facilitates long-term sustain, uh, sustainability. We've kind of talked about um, trauma. We gave some 
understanding of prevention science. The third objective is to understand community coalition. What is a community coalition? What we've understood about evidence-based programming or evidence-based strategies is that even among those, um, what communities really need to function in evidence-based ways would require us to use more than once evidence-based strategy. So what we've done is that we use collective impact, the idea of agencies coming together um, where as a community, we agree to address the issues. That would be collective impact. Um, collective impact really doesn't give us a whole lot in terms of how do we begin to understand the community and develop community strategies. It is strategic prevention framework that guides us in that area of the work. And the other area of the work is how do we get anchor agencies to align with what the data is telling us at the community level? How do we get the grant funders or the funders to fund the things that the data gives indication is the real root cause? How do we get communities to work together in concert and the funders fund those things so that we can begin to work with a supported continuum of care uh, with um, evaluation to determine our effectiveness is what evidence of success uh, kind of brought to the mix and helped us to understand that we can do great work on the community level, but except our work leads to system changes that align with what the needs are of the end user, then we'll have this perpetual, uh, you know, um, dog chasing the tail kind of uh, experience uh, addressing community needs. Next, next slide. So it doesn't happen in, this work doesn't happen like in step one, step two, step three. It's, it's a community process and many times activities are happening simultaneously and you know they overlap with the community coalition um the we're required to have representatives from different sectors of the community that see the problem or see the solutions differently it is a minimum we have to have a minimum of 12 sectors which include business, school, parents, youth, uh, civic, religious, um, uh, youth serving agencies, um, substance abuse agencies, government, all of us sitting at the, uh, around the planning table, looking at what the data saying and working through the process of understanding the data, planning how to address the data, and then ultimately implementing and evaluating is the utopia for the, the community process that we speak of. It is, it is the way to do community prevention, but as a community, uh, as Dr. Burke has said, my experience has been is that we're in a movement. We're not at that place yet. We're, we're working toward it. Um, and, and so as we, as we move closer toward um, uh, really addressing the needs of children, it, it becomes very clear that um, we, have, we have a good ways to go. We have a good ways to go. But this process of prevention science being relatively a new science, this process is, is, the, is the latest best practice and, and evidence. Uh, of, of how to go about doing, doing prevention. Uh, I said what I, what I had to say. I hope that I've addressed my three objectives for today. Several questions have come in, so we can, we can ask a few, and if any more come in, we can try and uh, kind of get questions that cover everyone's topics. Uh, do the ACES questions uh, asked in the questionnaire pose a liability risk for workers who are mandated reporters? So that was, to be honest with you, that was the obstacle that we ran into uh, trying to implement the survey in the school system. Um, 
And I think that's some of the resistance that we get with the school system in terms of, of, of um, um, having the school make this become a standardized way of gauging the wellness of children in the school system is that once they become aware of something, they have to address it. So uh, the answer, I, I guess the answer would be yes, that is a reality, uh, how we work around it. Um, that would take us as a collective community, um, you know, using our powers to be, uh, to say to systems, that's probably where change needs to occur. The next one is more of a comment. Sometimes experiences are so normalized that they don't realize that in fact it's a trauma. Uh, that the, 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 this person said they know about ACEs and it shocked me when they saw it the first time and still shocks me how we address symptoms and forget systems. Yeah, well, so we, we all have that experience if you've been doing prevention work in this community. Um, the challenge, that I did not expect when I started out was the politics of it all uh, at every level, at the government level, at the community level, at the individual level or the family <laughs> levels. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of how it could uh, create challenges in the process of working through this, this kind of work process. Um, so yes, I agree with you. Like, for example, um, the survey data in my particular community expressed that out of the 800 youth we surveyed, uh, it said 60% of the kids said they were being raised by parents who have an incarceration history. So what kind of impact does that really have on the community? And when leaders hear that kind of data, uh, not only leaders, but the community themselves were offended and, and people were, were actually angry with me for for saying it to the point where Annie Casey um, just helped educate me to understand that there's just some things you can't say in public, right? For whatever reasons. And if you say them, you have to be very uh, careful about how you say them. Um, but because I am a product of Liberty City, I, I take a stand that I can probably say that because I'm talking about my own house. And I'll say to those of us who, who, are, who happen to be of the same um, car, that you know, a, a addict don't get better until you can admit that you're an addict, <laughs> you know. And so the reality is, at some point, we've got to come to the reality of what's happening in our individual communities. Uh, the beauty of the ACEs is that it it makes it clear that um, it's not unique to ethnicity or social economic status. It's all of us. And so, if we can address prevention from the perspective of trauma through a trauma lens, then it is, it's inclusive of all of us. And the strategic prevention evidence, um, to strategic prevention framework is a process that can work in any community because the data is based upon the individual community. So, so uh, thank you very much, Reverend Dinkins, for your uh, uh, comprehensive and kind of like a challenging perspective invitation to, to keep the complexity of the issues affecting our communities and the framework, the preventive framework, as you describe it, uh, all in place. W one of the things that, that is a, a challenge when uh, for systemic thinkers of all types is, uh, is that, uh, that when it's hard to remain confident in our ability to intervene and, and be useful when we hold on to the complexity of all the things that are really uh, involved, all the factors that are affecting. Yeah. And uh, so I, I wanna just uh, throw in a, a piece of uh, optimism in, into this. And uh, um, as you know, I tend to see the, the, the glass half full all the time. And uh, so, uh, and I, I do think, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we had during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have developed an appreciation of the value of the individual act of what we do, of wearing the mask, keeping the distance of doing. So we have become preventive or prevention agents in the process. Um, that the effectiveness of that in our life is clear. The impact of it is clear. Uh, and it's also very consistent with the whole line of research in the field of, of violence in general and violence prevention that has to do with bystander, act, being an active bystander, learning to recognize what's dangerous, 
learning how to divert the situation, how to de-escalate. Um, so in many ways, I think it, it's, if it's just anything that we, we have learned is that if, even for the, so a much more broader issue and, and, and difficult task like the one that you presented to us today that has to do with the cumulative effects of trauma in our lives, we, are, we do well thinking about each of us as well-being ambassadors. Each of us have a place at the table. Each of us have a way of, uh, in our own way, to really affirm humanity, value the individual we're dealing with, giving them the right word, giving them the right expression of care and concern, standing our hands uh, at, the, at the very minimum. There are very things that we can do at all levels. And uh, so we not all have to be deep systemic thinkers to get it done. We, but we at each level need to really, we need to align our practices as you're suggesting from the government to the nonprofit organizations, to the places of worship, to the households, to the community level. We have to align the, the, our practices so that we know that we intentionally are well-being ambassadors of the sort that you are, I think, are, um, alluding to. And I'm very grateful to you to give us an opportunity to think about this at this moment in history. And uh, I'm sure that there are many leaders who, and many folks, and I, because I saw the folks that were attending the, the participants today, there are people from different parts of the region, uh, also with a fair amount of experience in coalitions and working with these issues. And I hope that they will feel empowered to reach out to you directly, to reach out to us, and to join us in this effort in building really uh, what we think is going to be a very impactful coalition and violence prevention um, plan for the whole Miami-Dade County. Thank you. Thank you very much.